Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Today we're going to discuss utility arches, which are a reasonably common type of orthodontic appliance used to intrude or retrude or procline upper and lower incisors. With me today is Dr. Ray Gilbert, who is a resident in the orthodontic program at the University of Michigan. I appreciate you. you coming along today. And what we're going to do is to discuss the little bit about the background and then the different types of utility arches and then finally the fabrication of one particular type. Utility Arch has been in existence for 20 or 30 years, and perhaps Bob Ricketts, among others, has been credited with the, uh, either the development or certainly the popularizing of this kind of treatment approach. Now, the Utility Arch actually comes in three different varieties, which are illustrated uh, on these two uh, typodonts. The first uh, type of arch, which I will call a, a basic Utility Arch, is shown in this, uh, on the lower model in this articulated set of models. And basically what we see here is a wire that goes into an auxiliary tube on the lower uh, molar bracket, drops downward, comes around to just distal to the lateral incisor, comes back up, and then goes across the front, and then does the same thing on the other side. Now, I, perhaps it would be better to illustrate this by using a drawing so that I can show the various manipulations of the utility arch, the basic utility arch. The basic components of the utility arch are the uh, bracket on the incisors, the bracket or the tube on the molars, and then the arch itself. Now, as you can see here, there are uh, two tubes on the molar bracket, and this, of course, is one reason why some people in the past have had difficulty in using the utility arch, because many times they do not have an auxiliary tube. The auxiliary tube houses the distal end of the utility arch, as is shown here, and then the clinician has a decision to make as to whether or not to extend the utility arch some distance, two or three millimeters ahead of the tube or whether to make the tube uh, or make the arch flush with the tube. Then the arch will go down approximately five millimeters, as shown here, then over forward to the uh, area of the uh, lower incisor, and this again would be done just distal to the lateral incisor. Then the arch would come upward, and of course this is very hard to show on a drawing, a three-dimensional uh, illustration just using a two-dimensional drawing such as this, and then finally around the outside like so. So that we see here in this particular drawing, the arch begins in the auxiliary tube. In this particular instance, uh, is anterior, just anterior to the tube, drops downward approximately five millimeters, goes across, comes back up again about five millimeters, and then through the anterior brackets. What is the purpose of this basic utility arch? The desired action of the wire is to intrude the lower incisor so that we should be getting ideally some type of intrusive force as indicated by this arrow. We also know that there is a another action and this is on the molar and we tend to get a distal tipping of the molar. Uh, in my experience it has not been uh, too great but I have seen instances where the lower molar if the utility arch is left in for a long time actually can be tipped significantly to the distal, even to the point where the uh, distal marginal ridge becomes very close to the gingiva. In order to uh, prevent that, when the wire is placed in the auxiliary tube, we usually use some type of buccal root torque. And one of the things that uh, Bob Ricketts talks about, and Carl Gugino for that matter, is using cortical anchorage to prevent the uh, molar from moving uh, in any particular direction. And so by having some type of activity or action which would flare the roots of the molar in a buccal direction, this is supposed to be the mechanism by which the anchorage is maintained in the molar region. Isn't there an advantage to that distal tipping action of the molar as far as leveling a curve of speed? 
Yeah, to, in many instances there really is because uh, sometimes a little bit of uh, distal tipping is advantageous from an arch length discrepancy problem as well. Uh, the main thing that we want to do is to get an intrusion of the lower incisor and that is, at least in my uh, clinical experience, that the utility arch, the basic utility arch, is one that that type of movement is uh, undertaken very easily. You've been using utility arches for the last year. What problems have you seen with regard to just a simple utility arch like this where there's no loops? Basically back around the buckle tube of the molar, a little bit of gingival impingement. So sometimes we'll step it out just a little bit on the buckle. Mm -hmm. And then other than that, it's a fairly straightforward um, type of arch wire to fabricate. Are you fairly clear on how to activate the appliance? Well, when you initially fit it, it's passive so that the anterior part of the utility arch is below the bracket. And then when you bring it up and engage it in the bracket, that, cause, that gives you your activation to intrude the incisors. Right. Okay, now how about after four to six weeks or however long the arch wire takes to become passive again? Then you would use something like a three-prong plier or a um, tweed loop bending plier and form a gable bend in the um, horizontal section and bend it so that it comes up towards the occlusal surface. I think that one of the demonstrator models uh, illustrates the type of gable bend uh, in which the gable itself is pointed toward the occlusal in both the lower arch uh, and the upper arch. Now this particular model shows two variations of the utility arch for uh, two different functions, uh, one of which is to procline the incisors and one is to recline or retrocline the incisors as well. Perhaps the most commonly used utility arch in my own practice is the uh, retraction utility arch. And this is not only used to intrude teeth, but also is used to uh, move them in a posterior direction. Uh, this uh, artist drawing of the uh, different types of utility arches perhaps makes it uh, a little bit easier to understand. Uh, the retraction utility arch is used, uh, of course, in a patient who has flaring of the upper incisors. It also works very nicely in the retraction in mass of the uh, upper four anterior teeth particularly, for example, if you had extracted an upper first bicuspid or even an upper second bicuspid. And also, even in a non-extraction case, this type of arch works very nicely in the uh, correction of a deep bite or correction of really any type of anterior problem, uh, whether it be a vertical problem or even a midline problem. That if you have some spacing, for example, uh, distal to the lateral incisor, uh, this spacing can be adjusted to the point where the midlines are corrected. Now the retraction utility arch uh, once again begins in the auxiliary tube. Now you'll notice that there is about a five millimeter um, space between the uh, anterior part of the auxiliary tube and the vertical part of the utility arch. The reason for that of course is to allow for an activation of the appliance by taking the wire through the tube and then turning it up with a wine guard plier or some other type of plier like so. The uh, base part of the wire or the gingival part of the wire as we see here uh, traverses below the gingival margin in the gingival reflex area and then recurves downward with a 90 degree angle before a loop is placed in the arch wire. After this is accomplished, the loop is carried downward as we see here and then around across uh, the front of the four incisors and then of course it repeats on the other side. Now once again, if this is going to be activated, uh, usually a gable bend will be placed. I prefer using a uh, tweed loop bending plier more than a three prong because I find that it works very nicely for activation. But this would be done so that this type of bend would be placed uh, in the upper utility arch. Now the lower arch drawn in this particular example is a protraction utility arch. In fact, it is very rarely used in the lower arch, but is more often used in the upper arch, particularly in the case of a class two division two type of individual. You'll notice the difference uh, in the design. Uh, first of all, there is nothing sticking out the back end of the auxiliary tube because there is no need to cinch this back as we saw in the, upper, uh, in the upper example. The arch wire 
uh, extends uh, in the tube as we see here, comes down in a 90 degree angle, again about five millimeters, and then the gingival part of the wire comes around like so. Now in contrast to the uh, retraction utility arch, which has the loop on the anterior aspect of the, um, of the individual, in this particular instance, we find that the loop is compacted or compressed as it is activated into the uh, brackets of the lower incisors. And therefore, the activity of this particular type of, a, of arch is going to be to procline the lower incisors. Once again, if you were to put a gable bend in, and this again would be directed in, a, in an occlusal direction, uh, this would have the effect of intruding these teeth. Uh, for the most part, uh, this uh, activity is accomplished, particularly if you have a class two, division two type of individual, in which you want both proclination and a reduction in the uh, vertical uh, overbite. Is there a provision to reactivate the proclination utility arch when necessary? Uh, many times the, the easiest way to activate these uh, wires is to take the arch wire out of the bracket, and this drawing has it held in by a power chain. And then you can many times just straighten this part out, making it like a 45 degree angle instead of a 90 degree angle. That will in, uh, activate the lower incisors or in usually the upper incisors uh, approximately one to two millimeters, and that seems to be an adequate activation. And the, as the helix unwinds, on the lower, it allows proclination of the incisors. Right. And on the top, as it unwinds, it retracts your incisors. Exactly. And exactly. that's where you get the activation. Right. Now, one of the big problems that, that you can run into, and one of the reasons why I changed the design, because it used to be that we had a, the loop placed in this direction, as I've shown here, is the fact that the patient can end up getting some rather significant uh, sore spots in the gingival area or on the inside of the upper lip. And so great care must be taken uh, in fitting the utility arch to make sure that it does not impinge either on the gingiva as shown in here or on the inside of the lip. And I also usually tell the patient that uh, when this is being um, put into place that, the, uh, that this is a very, I won't say a risky type of an appliance, but certainly one in which uh, we can end up with more problems than just a regular arch wire in the bracket. Is there a rule of thumb as to how much gingival relief the horizontal section should have away from the mucosa? Oh, maybe one or two millimeters at most. Certainly not any more than two or three, because otherwise you'll end up with a, a line on the cheek or a sore spot on the lip. Does the distal uh, leg of the helix is bent to the facial? on Which up here? On both arches, correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, the it steps it out a little Yeah, bit. that's exactly right. That's very, the same way that you would make a, a retraction arch uh, or a retraction spring. Another important aspect about this is the wires that are used. And of course, it makes a difference as to whether you use an 018 slot or an 022 slot uh, as far as your basic uh, appliance uh, sizes. Now, the, the wires that I recommend, which of course is, again, part of bioprogressive therapy, is the unheat-treated blue algeloid wire. Uh, for an 018 slot, which is what I use in my practice, uh, it is recommended in a lower basic utility arch to use an 016 square. However, in the upper arch, or even in the lower arch for that matter, it's perhaps better to use an 016 by 022. In a, a case of, of a 022 slot, it's recommended that an 019 by 019 arch wire be used. Uh, also, you could use an 019 by 022. But these uh, arch wires, and again, I would stress the blue algeloid arch wire, uh, tend to, to provide the proper uh, strength or force to achieve the, re the desired result. Is the blue algeloid preferable because it is less resilient than some of the other um, stainless steel arch wires? Well, I can't give you a biomechanical or biomaterials answer to that because most of my own experience has been using blue algaloy. Uh, what I find is that it is very predictable in its response. It's an extremely soft wire in comparison to, let's say, a regular stainless steel arch. And I find that it is very easily activated in the mouth. 
and I can think of practically no instances where I've overactivated it, where I've gotten into trouble. And so I think it has enough latitude that it really does not cause much problem uh, in a routine clinical manner. Another possible advantage to using the unheat treated Elgeboy is the ease of bending it and so that if you're going to activate it intraorally, you're going to want something that's going to make that as easy as possible for right. both yourself and the patient uh, comfort. Another question I have is you always seem to use a rectangular or a square wire. Wouldn't there be indications for using a round wire for a utility arch? I, I haven't seen too many indications. I imagine that if you were going to just try to procline teeth, it wouldn't make too much difference. Okay. But I find that uh, in general for ease of control of the, uh, the tipping, for example, of the lower incisors and the upper incisors, that the rectangular wire itself is very advantageous. I must admit over the last year I've been somewhat surprised, however, uh, that it is not always as easily taught as it is for me to do to use these arches because I've seen a few examples or a few instances in some of the patients that I have observed over the last year that uh, have actually shown some unwanted proclination of the lower incisors. And I think that basically is due to the not only the design of the appliance or the design of the utility arch, but also the method of activation. I think it's very important that if you want to prevent any type of proclination of the incisors, and that's particularly true in a basic utility arch, that you should try to snug it back slightly. And by doing so, you almost never get any type of uh, proclination of the lower incisors. Is the amount of activation different for a 16 square than, say, a 19 square due to the um, added stiffness of a 19 square wire? I think that that's probably true. Uh, once again, I have not done a uh, precise biomaterials type of uh, study of that, but I would say that the uh, 16 by 22, let's say, which is the one I usually use, mm -hmm. is very easily activated by a full crimp of a tweed loop bending plier, whereas a 19 square, perhaps you should do less than that. Okay, and when it's initially placed, you put it, um, say, at the bottom of the bracket, two or three millimeters below the bracket slot, Right, somewhere between the bottom of the bracket and the gingival margin, certainly okay. not too much further than that. Okay. I think it would be appropriate now to make a utility arch, and I'm going to demonstrate this on one of the models from before. And what I'm going to be making is a retraction utility arch using the 016 by 022 blue algaloy. These come in about a 20 inch or two foot strip. And what I will be doing using a distal end cutter or any other kind of wire cutter we'll be just cutting a section in half and then we will be using this part for the construction of the utility arch. Now we have taken the arch wire out of the model that I showed you before and so I'll be using this to demonstrate the fabrication of the appliance. Now the two major types of pliers that are used in fabricating the utility arch are the tweed loop bending plier which I show here as you can see, there are three turrets on the loop bending plier, and we always use the largest of the three turrets uh, in fabricating the loops on the utility arch. The second of these is what I have just called always a tweed plier. What's the term that you use? 142 tweed arch forming plier? Yeah. And these work out very nicely as far as doing the simple right angle bends of the uh, wire. Now I've taken a piece of 016 by 022 and I'm now going to put in a right angle bend. And this is done before I ever uh, see the patient. Then I go up about five millimeters, as you can see, uh, between the right angle and where the pliers are located then. And then just using uh, pressure of the thumb, uh, place uh, the first step of the arch wire uh, in position as is shown there. These should be parallel. Like so. Now at this point in time after I've made a oh, an 8 to 10 millimeter segment in here I will then go to the patient in this case it's going to be a typodont and I will place the wire in the auxiliary tube, like so. Now usually this will extend about to the middle to the front of the second bicuspid. At this point in time, I will then lay the arch wire gently around 
the arch, and then taking a marking pencil, make a small mark between the uh, lateral incisor and the cuspid. Then the arch wire is removed from the patient. I go back to the tweed arch forming pliers once again and place another 90 degree bend in the wire. Like so. Then the loop bending pliers are used to place a 360 degree loop so that the wire now again is resumed its 90 degree course from the gingival part of the utility arch. And then we take the arch forming pliers and place another 90 degree bend which will become the incisal wire and this now is going to be going across the area of the uh, incisor brackets. At this point in time, I then will use my fingers holding the utility arch at the junction of the incisal wire and will place a gentle bend in the wire to begin to form the arch contour. This is very easily done using the blue algaloid wire. You now see the area of the molar extension, the gingival part, the loop, and then the beginning of the incisal contour. You also notice that the, the length of the vertical step in the molar area is in fact a little bit shorter, about four or five millimeters, than it is in the anterior area. And in this case, you can get away with six or seven millimeters uh, in a, an upper uh, utility arch case. I notice the distal extent of the helix is always towards the outside of the facial. And does that help you with your canine offset? Exactly. That's always the way it is done, that the wire comes around, circles, and then goes inside the wire and, or inside the arch and then continues around. All right, I've now placed the uh, molar portion of the utility arch through the auxiliary tube, placed it around in position and we're now going to take the pencil once again and mark the arch wire at the point just distal to the lateral incisor. Then the arch bending plier is used to place a 90 degree bend followed by the tweed loop bending plier once again. And in this case you somewhat have to guess the exact size and position, or not size, but the position of that loop. Now we've placed the incisal part, then a right angle step, then a loop continuing up vertically. Then I go back to the loop bending pliers. And make a reverse bend. Again, continuing on in a parallel fashion to the uh, anterior area. I noticed when you made the second helix and the 90 degree bend after it was made, you used the loop forming pliers, whereas on the first helix, you used the 142 uh, tweed pliers. Right. That's so that you can get the proper, uh, the proper bend in this area here. Now, after this point, what I usually do is to go in and basically eyeball the distance from the loop to the uh, to the vertical offset in front of the molar and replicate it on the other side, especially in an, in an arch where you, this is not too critical and you have four or five millimeters to play with. This can be done quite easily. Then I complete the arch by putting in two right angle bends with about a four, four or five millimeter gap in between. Now, as you can see at this point that the arch itself is somewhat asymmetrical. I then take First of all, the distal end cutters trim off the wire approximately the same length as on the other side. Then I will take the loop bending pliers or the, the arch forming pliers, in this case I'll use the arch forming pliers, and establish the contours with my finger, with just finger pressure.
putting in a little bit of cuspid offset. And you can see that this wire is very, very soft and is easily bendable. This is the final configuration of the utility arch, and you'll notice a reasonably symmetrical uh, contour. At this point in time, the arch wire will then be placed back in the patient's mouth. Then the arch wire is moved into place, centered properly, using either wine guard pliers or finger pressure or whatever, and then it will be placed in position in the brackets using an elastic chain. The final adjustment, uh, aside from the comfort adjustment to the patient, is the activation. And all is done here is it is grasped either with wine guards or a uh, hemostat or something of that sort, and then bent upward like so. And you can see the effect of moving this loop. It closes the loop and puts in a retraction force on the uh, upper incisors. And then to activate it further, if you're going to reactivate it or if it was made passively to begin with, these uh, tweed loop bending pliers are again used with a gingival force of just placing a gable bend like so. This completes the activation of the retraction utility arch. That pretty well summarizes the material that I wanted to cover in this. Do you have any comments or questions? Why do you use the power chain to hold it in place? The power chain is there strictly to close the spaces in the anterior area. Usually if a case has been, uh, has been just recently bonded, I'll usually just use, say, just a regular donuts. But other than that, the power chain works really very well. Most of the time, in almost all the cases that I treat, I usually consolidate the front four anterior teeth as soon as possible. And then they are handled as a unit with the utility arch. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope this has been of some help, and I thank you very much for helping me out thank today. You. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.